how is not taking action helping you? Why is failure such a bad thing? How can failure be a good thing? The 80-20 principle applies to how people live. And I think most people, unfortunately, live in the 80% what they don't realize how their life could be. No Tony Robbins conference is going to magically save you. I saw Mark Zuckerberg do it, and he's also a genius. Hey, Noah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on my first podcast. First ever podcast. So you, you, you're quite a myth and a legend out there. Um, I've known about you through, through Tim Ferriss, Joe Polish, a bunch of other, uh, mutual misfits. Um, but you, you've actually got quite a little accolade. Let's, let's go through this. You called yourself a cubicle monkey at Intel, number mm. 30 employee at Facebook, number four mm. at Mint. And you, you, <laughs> I like this bit. You helped design the Facebook ads program. You're welcome. Tell us. You know, what have you been up to to get from all of there? We're going to go into your book, AppSumo, but that's quite an accolade to be in those companies. Thank How you. did that start? It started because I got started. You know, I just got going. It wasn't necessarily, you know, now looking back, I'm able to have patterns and things I was able to teach through Million Dollar Weekend. But for me, I always had this dream of being in tech and I had a dream of being rich. I was just like, I want to get rich. I'm going to be my own boss. I don't, I don't want to work for anyone. And so it, I kept starting things. And so I was able to get the Facebook job because I hated my job at Intel. And I was like, I'm going to keep starting businesses until I finally figured this out. And by starting things, I went to Facebook. They're like, oh, cool. You're, you seem like you built a lot of stuff. I built you know, collegeup.org, a Craigslist for college students, comegetused.com, a, a book exchange site. I built all these things and conferences and so I think it made it easy for them, just for, for others out there, if you're applying for a job, by showing that you do things, not by telling people you're going to do things, it gives them a higher confidence you're going to do well at this job. Like, I just hired a new producer for my YouTube channel. And this guy made a full website. It's Dylan is the best creator for NoahKagan.com or something like that. And he created this amazing website with pictures and videos and descriptions. And a lot of other people just sent in a CV. And so I was doing that. And, th and that led me then to be at Facebook, even though I got fired, which is the story's been been out there. I'm happy to share again. But that led me then to keep trying more things to find mint.com, which I helped build. Uh, we sold for almost 200 million bucks to Intuit. And then through that process, probably around the time I was 30, starting and building all these things, I finally figured out what I love to do. And it was what I love to do for free. I think that's what everyone can copy. What do you love to do for free? And how do you make that your job? And, and it was AppSumo.com. And I love promoting things. I love marketing and I love deals. And, and that's what AppSumo is. It's software deals for entrepreneurs. And I was able to start that in a, in a weekend for about 60 bucks and $12 of that was the domain. <laughs> and that's possible for anyone out there, whether you want to be a podcaster like ourselves or an author or sell cookies or have e-commerce, which I've done or software business that applies to, to every type of business. So you wanted to be rich. That was your craving, but you thought you could only get rich by actually doing it yourself rather than actually you know, working for someone. Because as you were saying, you went to Facebook, but you were already developing all these other plants. So you saw the the, the, the future of your bank account by the, the, the design of your own hands. So you realized you had to invent your own position. Did you ever find that getting into somewhere like Facebook, did they ever get concerned that you were the kind of guy with, that would take their IP and then jump on again? <laughs> I mean, they're smarter than me. And a lot of rich people are, are very not smart. I've learned that a lot of that uh, on my YouTube channel, which is impressive. Seeing all these people that have just had ordinary businesses and their ordinary lives, but they've gotten started, have success. Now, I think what you called out is really interesting. The best investment anyone can make is entrepreneurship not necessarily even buying a book, just starting your own business. Like the best return of the stock market, 12%. Oh, wow. Crypto, 100%. Boohoo. You get a raise, 10%. It's all good, but the return on starting a business is unlimited. And so I didn't really know the right path for me to get there, but I knew that that was the approach I wanted to take. And I would take some time. And I always felt like, you know, I felt like I'd be stuck in this middle-class lifestyle where how I was raised and how I was taught. And it, it always felt so close. Like it was going to be pulled out of my grasp. Like Facebook fired me, Mint fired me. My next company got banned by Facebook and sued by a competitor. I was like, geez, man, is it, is it not for me? But I, you know, I do think there's something out there about how persistence beats resistance and sticking with things. And eventually, uh, it was able to lead me to, to create something for no money and almost no time, which became AppSumo.com, which today, you know, does almost $80 million a year. And that was able to be started in, in a weekend for a few bucks. And 
all these big companies, Facebook and the ones we're talking about, also started with just one person or two people in relatively short amounts of time. And I, I think people don't realize that. And they think there's this big, scary task of entrepreneurship. Risky is having a shitty life, you know, not dealing drugs like you said you, you were doing and that's how you got rich. <laughs> but, you know, doing a, a day job, which my mom had, she was a nurse. And I have a lot of respect for all these nurses, but my mom hated being a nurse. And so I, you know, I wish for all these people, it's like, you can create your own life. And, and that's what entrepreneurship does for me. And, and I do think can do for, for everyone. Hey, I'm sorry for interrupting this podcast. I know it's a brilliant one, but I wanted to talk to you about your room, your connections. Now we know full well, the great things come from great connections and great rooms. Now, if you're in a room full of people that will challenge you, inspire you, motivate you and support you, then great. But if not, then maybe I have the solution for you. Head on over to stevedsims.com, look up Sims Distillery there, and join our community of creative disruptors, those that are only not there to help you and motivate and actually give you information, but to support and answer questions. We very much vet the room to make sure that we support each other's growth. We all want each other to grow. So if you want to be in the right room, head on over to stevedsims.com slash Sims Distillery, and I'll see you inside my room. Enjoy the rest of the show. Now, I did a podcast actually earlier this morning. They were asking me this question, which you're now showing on this theme. A lot of people think they need to know the answers of what they're getting into. You knew you just had to gain momentum. You just had to start something. You could work out where it was in the, in, in the meantime or once you'd started. Yeah. But the thing that I liked about your conversation, I want to highlight because I don't want to look past it was, oh, I got fired from this, oh, I got sued and banned for this, oh, that kind of closed down. How do you relate to those, I'm not going to call them failures, but those educational moments when the shit hits the fan and it didn't kind of go to plan? How do you handle and work with those? Yeah, uh, two comments on that. I was talking with a guy who's reading Million Dollar Weekend and going through the process now of the framework, and he has this idea for the past years and he's just not taking action. And I, and I asked him today, I said, how is not taking action helping you? How is this serving something for you? Because there's clearly something he's enjoying about being able to make excuses about why he's not getting going. And it's serving him in a, in a powerful way. Now, what, I, what I'm working with him on and, and p other people who have had this, and especially for myself, is why is failure such a bad thing? How can failure be a good thing? So when I do YouTube videos, I, I go up to people on the streets, I knock on people's doors, I have rejection goals. And it's something we teach a lot where you get rejected and you're like, huh, that's not so bad. Let me get one more. Let me get one more. And then you get a few and then you find out you actually get some yeses. And everyone has quit too soon. And so I'm really, I'm, I'm proud of myself and everyone can do it. It's not exclusive. Stick with things. That's why I've teach the law of 100. Like how do you do 100 videos, 100 podcasts when most people quit at one? So for myself, it's a practice, right? Like I had a big enough dream. I just didn't want to work for anyone. I had a freedom number which was 3000 bucks. I was like, if I can just make this amount of money, I can quit my job and never work for a Zucker nothing again. And then I just practice it. I was like, all right, let me get rejected here. And you know, over time you realize the rejection is never as scary as we seem. Like I was talking today and even on, you know, small, silly things, Steve, we're moving to Spain. My girlfriend's from Spain and we we're going to move apartments. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to move apartment. Why don't we just stay this one? And she's like, it's really not as bad as you think. You just like hire someone and they'll move the boxes. And I was like, yeah, you're right. It's never as scary as it seems. And, that, and that's how we find out who we are as people. We think about what's what we're afraid of. And then we realize we can face it. And then we realize, damn, we have courage. And there's a lot more color and richness in life than we realize. And that's available for everyone free. Oh, I like that. So you've got you got the failure aspect, you know, the education and where it's going. Aren't you noticing that a lot of people today are just scared of being scared? And they will use fear to get in the way. Some people are scared of failure. Some people are scared of fear. And both of those things are actually holding them back. Holding them back. You've just turned around. You you just explained it that that's where the color of life is to actually go forward. Was that something that was inherently in you as a child, or was it mm. something that kind of developed as you developed? I'm still afraid. <laughs> and how do you? <laughs> so how do you handle it? How do you treat it? Yeah, you practice it. You practice it, and so. Another thing that you can do around fear, it's look, to be clear, I think people, you have like some of these Jocko Wilnick or David Goggins, go do 10,000 mile pushups and with one leg and cut your penis off. I'm like, <laughs> one, that's just not sustainable. And who wants to do that shit? You know, for me, it's like, how do I do it in a fun way? Realize it's not so scary and be like, oh, that's kind of cool. That's why like, here's some small ways you can practice being afraid. You face it and you're like, oh, that was okay. 
a lot of times business, what it really is, is getting started, right? So just getting going in the now, like today, right this moment on your phone, on social media, on a podcast, put it out your first episode, getting going now. And then the fear of being asking for something, right? Asking for the raise, asking for the customer, asking for the guest, asking for the promotion, asking for the partnership. And if you can practice it in a small way where it's not as scary and it's kind of fun. So one small one everyone can do literally today. Next time you see anyone on the street that you like how they look, just compliment them and then say, where did you buy it from? And then they'll tell you that's, you almost get hundred percent smiling when they, you do that. And then you're like, oh, I kind of asked them for something. That's cool. Now just do the coffee challenge where you ask people for a discount when you buy a cup of tea or coffee. That's something I came up with about 15 years ago. And it's a silly one, but it's the most powerful fear rejection thing that you'll face. And then you realize you have a, your ego is really sensitive, but it can move forward. And it's not so bad. And then you realize, holy shit, if I can actually ask for things I want, I can really start getting the things I want. You're not just getting the things you get. That's cool. If you, if you, if you step up, no, that's absolutely beautiful. Um, I love the, compl- I love the co- communication side of things. You know, a lot of people now, especially with COVID, we're scared to communicate. Now you've just said about complimenting someone on their outfit and going, Hey, where did you get that? A lot yeah. of people are terrified to do that. And they, they, they're, they're frightened of this eye contact. And let's be serious, 99% of the planet in any major city is hiding behind a cell phone. So you are physically interrupting them even when it's to make a compliment about that coat. You know, how do you feel about the ability to communicate has changed and what do we need to do about that? Mm. I mean, I think the the base needs of humans are pretty 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 consistent over years, right? Yeah. There's Maslow, Maslow stuff. I think most of us want to be time millionaires. We want to be able to do what we want with our time. But I think in terms of communication, I think there's a misconception around fear, rejection, and, and really asking, which is something I, I go in deep in Million Dollar Weekend and help people overcome it in a fun way is that when you're asking, it's a negative. It's not a negative if you say, hey, buddy, can I borrow your lawnmower? Or hey, can I get feedback? Which everyone can get feedback. That's a great way to improve on anything. It's not, you don't feel bad about it. But for some reason, if you created something, maybe a book, maybe a podcast, maybe a product, you're like, hey, I, I actually, let me ask if this is a problem you have. Can I get your opinion? Oh, it is? I actually can help you with it. And the more you realize it's not necessarily a negative to ask people for things and it can actually be a positive thing. You kind of flip the, you flip it. You realize like, Oh shit, like let me start asking people things I think are good for them. And if it's not good for them, great. I can ask them why not. And if they don't want it great, or they can maybe give me a referral and move on to someone else. I, I don't think it's a superpower. I still want to ask people get afraid, right? But it is a muscle that the more I've done it now, I've done it for many, many years the more. It actually, it does get easier though, even though there's still some fear in me. I love the I love I love the way you actually said having uh, looking for rejections and and actually can I like, go for a certain amount of them I absolutely love that now you've come out with million dollar weekend um I take it you can buy it on the usual Amazon and is there a website that's best to go to where can people first of all get this book yeah, mil- before we go mm-hmm. into it yeah, milliondollarweekend.com. We have the 48 hour challenge in there we change your life in a weekend 52 times a year you can change your life uh, it's all a million dollar weekend templates, step by step videos, checklists. Everything is going to be at milliondollarweekend.com. You can also get the book there. All right. So, the big question why the book? Yeah. I'm, uh, do you want the real answer? Yeah. I want to know I why you, like- you decided I'm going to yeah. do this book. Yeah. It's not to get rich because I think some people are like, oh, he's trying to get rich. I'm like, I'm already rich. Uh, the book <laughs> does not get me rich at all. It was a lot of time. Yeah. Much, I could get a lot wealthier in, in many other ways. But what was fascinating for me was that I always felt afraid of doing it. And I've dreamed of a book for about 15 years, but I always thought like, Oh, who am I to write a book? And this is a common thing for all of us. Like, who am I to have a show? Who am I to start a business? And you realize like, who, why the not you? Mm -hmm. And for myself, I've worked literally with the best entrepreneurs on earth. I worked with Bill Gates, not directly, but I worked at Microsoft. So I gotta see how that run worked directly for Zuckerberg, help build mint.com. Like, I've done a lot of the, and then I've started my own businesses so many times again and again and again, tidycal.com, sendfox.com, absumo.com, kings. And you could see all my businesses. A lot of the people out there, I have a hundred million dollars of money. It's like, where's your business? Oh yeah. You can't see it. It's imaginary and they're imaginary authors. And so by doing, working for the best, doing it a time and time again, and then helping, literally I was on a call for free with six people today because I like doing it and I want to see people take action. It got me feeling more confident that, yes, there's something in me that I I don't think there's any business book out there because that can actually change people's lives in the amount of time and without spending more money. 
like Million Dollar Weekend could. And that's what I've always wanted that I wish I had when I was 10. Then I got excited to make money, but I never knew there was a way. And most business books, what they do wrong, and it's because they've never done it time and time again to help people do it. They're like, oh, here's recipes, Steve. Here's the recipe for Facebook ads. <laughs> here's the recipe for how to tweet. Here's how to Shopify your site. And I'm like, okay, give that book to someone. Ask them in a week. How are they doing? They haven't done shit. Why not? Because they're afraid. But they don't think they're afraid. And that's the problem. And that, that's not even the problem. That's just the opportunity, I would say. They don't realize that they're afraid of all the, of who they can be. And so in the book, it's how do we create a fun narrative? How do we create fun challenges? How do we create a fun experience that can actually inspire them to be like, let me do some of the, these silly challenges. I can't believe it's going to work. And then halfway through the book, they're like, holy shit, I have a few customers. I can't believe it actually works. And this is the book I always wanted. And uh, it's my only one book I'm going to do. And so I put it all together. I'm proud of it. I hired the best business writer on earth. Uh, he's written two of the best selling books of all time. Uh, yeah, in business, Tal Raz. And uh, it's everything I got to help people. If they're interested in copying my life and beyond. Uh, it's going to be in Million Dollar Weekend. Where are you hoping this book's going to get you next? Because you're quite right. I don't know if it, well, I say I don't know of, I think there was a stat out once that there's no such thing as a millionaire author. And the first thing people turn around is they go, well, what about, you know, um, you know, the Harry Potter trilogy, the movies made her millions, not the book. So, you know, yeah. where are you hoping this book's going to take you? Because you, you're right. You've got the money. You've got the notoriety as much as you want, and you could make more money with the time. But why? Where are you hoping this book's going to kind of like lead you into, or, or or do you are you just hoping to change people? I'm already where I, I need to be, candidly. Okay. I don't. There's nowhere else I really want to go. So I, I'm really, truly, I feel blessed. I was telling my girlfriend today how lucky we are. Like I get a, I get a promote AppSumo.com, which I love, software deals for entrepreneurs. I get to talk about this book, which I do think will help people. I make YouTube videos, which people seem to really get inspired by on their business journeys. And I get to run a company promoting deals, which I love. So what I actually hope is the book comes out, people change their lives, talk the shit out of it, tell everyone about it. And I'm not having to necessarily promote it as much. And I have more, I, I will have more time to spend with my girlfriend. So that's where I, th I think it'll lead me. I do think this book will make a dent. Uh, I'd like to see it around 10 years. Most books make a blip and die. And at the end of the day, books are, are sold through impact, right? Like, I'm, does this make, did you get some delta in your life in it? And so near term, not much, just more time. And then long term that people in 10 years are like, yeah, I read this book and it made a change for me. Now, AppSumo, just quickly switching to that. I've been yeah. a subscriber, you know. I, oh, I, so cool. That's so cool. I don't know how many apps and uh, programs and software that me and Henry have actually purchased through that, but it's always been, and it's the weirdest stuff that you didn't even know you had the problem. And then there's a program <laughs> for it. And we go, yeah. So I, I've got to admit, mean? it's like my favorite porn site of just like, oh, I want to buy that. So I got so <laughs> many, so many of these little programs. In today's world, we can launch a business in seconds. Launch a website, launch a brand, launch an identity. Why do you think people are not? Deep pause. Yeah. I'm thinking about specific people and why haven't they done it? I don't want to put shade on anyone, so I won't say their names. I think they're, you know, the 80-20 the principle applies to how people live. And I think most people, unfortunately, live in the 80% what they don't realize how their life could be. And so they just accept it. Uh, yeah. And 20% actually start thinking like, hey, maybe I could put out myself on YouTube. And I put myself out on YouTube with just my phone. No fancy gear. I'm in a $20,000 studio at home, which is insane. I have one button here. <laughs> I don't know if I can pull it up, but I have one button. I can just, everything turns on. I get on this camera <laughs> that that's over time though. And that got started immediately. You know, I just got started now, not how I didn't worry about my camera gear. When I started, it was just a phone. And so most people don't realize how their lives can be like, I'll even, I'll call it my brother. He's a doctor. He spent 10 years in school, 300,000 in debt. And he's jealous of people like me because I was like, didn't, you don't have to follow that path. Like there's a lot of doctors who now can have their own businesses 
they could have popular YouTube channels or you don't even have to be a doctor. There's a lot of people teaching medicine on YouTube who make millions. They never even went to school. So I think they're re realizing that there's new paths out there and then being willing to get started, as I said, with my YouTube channel and then stick with it. You know, every billionaire I've interviewed took 20 years minimum to become a billionaire. And for my brother, I have another friend, he works at Amazon. They didn't become rich in, you know, in the weekend, they started things and they've definitely had success, but if they could just stick with it, then yes, they would have had these other types of lifestyles. So it does, it's realizing that they're not getting the immediate gratification. And so I, I do think with million dollar weekend, it's like, all right, let's check to make sure this could be a million dollars. Let's get a little bit of money today and then let's keep building up towards that and sticking with things, which, you know, law of 100 is something I just talked with you about, you know, sticking with it at least a hundred days or a mm -hmm. hundred posts. So for myself with, with appsumo.com, even as an example, my first year, I paid myself $12,000. Second year, $40,000. Third year, $75,000. My job at Intel and Mint.com, I, I was going to make six figures. I was making $100,000. So for them, it, didn't, it doesn't happen immediately, and I think there's a little frustration around that. And uh, you know, last year with AppSumo, it's around $3 million. So, and I get to live half my year in Spain and all these other amazing, amazing opportunities. But that do take a little bit of time. And so for, for people like my brother and others out there, you know, it's, it's getting started, realizing it's real. Let's just start realizing it's amazing and it's available. Not even amazing. Realizing you can live whatever life you want in the 20%. Getting started right now and then figuring out how can you make it enjoyable for you to stick with it for some period of time. And it doesn't have to be millionaire status. So I have a lot of people who I'm working with and seeing that are like, I just want to have creativity. I just want to have an option where if my boss chooses to fire my ass, then I can tell him to screw off and I don't have to be so worried about that especially if you have a family or if you yeah. have a mortgage. And so, you know, I would say it's those things. They, they don't believe those levels existed, which I didn't for some period of time. Like I made money. I didn't believe I was supposed to enjoy it, which sounds kind of crazy, I know, for most people. And then starting it and then keeping with it, uh, I would say is, is what's holding a lot of people back around these things. Now, there's a great, there's a great, um, what's the word? Uh, I'm, I'm getting a, a great sense of fun off of you you mm. like to have fun you like to enjoy life you know we joked before the show you know talking about you try to find these fun narratives that you can have within your business how important is fun in constructing a business and a life for yourself that's my purpose here on earth but why do people well, think that it should have because people think you know you go to work <laughs> that's not fun you should be working <laughs> And they try to kind of split them. Yet in my in, in my travels, I've seen the most creative people in the planet. They play. Uh, how important is playtime for you? <laughs> before one, well, that sounds like a little kid. But before the show, yeah. I have an arcade in my house, so I was playing on my Godzilla pinball machine. I'm cramping already, you know. But taking a step back here, you know, that's that's a script that we're saying. Like it can't be fun. It shouldn't be fun. Work can't be fun. Yeah. Uh, and that's all that's all, you know, person made uh, that we are these narratives that people made up. And I do believe work should not be a job. And my work, which is insane, and this is something that took time to find what it, what I wanted to be was like creating content, being out there with books or YouTube and so forth, promoting things and then talking about these things. And I'm like, this is my work. I get paid for this. And, you know, the, the thing I would say with working with people as well, there's a guy named Mitchell at AppSumo that I work with. And a lot of times I'm a pretty shitty boss to him. I don't even like being a boss and I don't want it to be anybody's boss, but I'm kind of always ragging on him. And I one day was like, Mitchell, I think you're doing great. Maybe let's have a little bit more fun here and try to play with what we're working on. And, and then he was really inspired. And he calls me later. He's like, dude, I'm, I love that meeting. That was the best meeting we've had in literally a year. And I was like, oh, oh, everyone else wants to have fun too. How do we make it more of a fun environment where you don't have to show up? Like that's the best way to, to treat your partner, make it a place that they want to be. That's how the best way to treat your teammates, the best way to treat yourself. Like how do you enjoy these things more? And if you're not enjoying it, either quit or figure out a way to make it more enjoyable. Oh, that's nice. That is nice. Um, we mentioned Joe. Are you having are you are you having fun with your show? Uh, it sounds I, seems I, like I, it. I do. Um, because for me it's just an excuse to speak to interesting people. You know, it's, I've always refused to sponsor it. I've always refused to have advertised on it because I, I, I'm not saying about the sellout thing. Hey, we all like to make money to pay the mortgage and buy the toys, but I wanted it to always be something which was a great, you know, excuse for me to be able to speak to someone like yourself and go, Hey, 
let me chat with you for 30 to 40 minutes yeah. and get some really cool aspects. So I find it fun. Um, you, it seems like you're having fun. And, you know, like I, I will say that the most successful things do get boring. Right? They, they do. And the best way to be really successful is find something boring and stick with it. Right. And so there is this balance. Right. And this is this is a really, you know, I'm 41 now. And in my 20s and 30s, I was always chasing, chasing money, mm. chasing, feeling good, chasing views and va validation. And in my 40s, what I've noticed is that I, I'm it's more fun for me to win. And what's winning is boring. And what's boring is things that work. And so I just focus a lot more on not trying to get the new thing and just try to find the thing that works and stick with that. So sticking with the videos that work, sticking with the deals on AppSumo that work and that our customers seem excited about and sticking with, you know, myself and like, all right, well, maybe not drinking as much makes me feel good. And, and these other these other behaviors, and it's like, well, keep doing more of those. <laughs> and it's like it's definitely been uh, interesting because it's not as there's not as novelty. Right. You're not like I don't get a new thing every day, but there's more depth and there's a lot more enjoyment around those things. Now, we mentioned Joe Polish earlier. Um, mm. Joe Polish mentioned a, a quote, and I don't know where he got it from, but um, he turned around and he said, the definition of hell is to meet the man or woman you could have been. Now, mm. you've got the finances, you've got, you've got the bank account, you've got the peace, you've got the fun, so you're very assured and confident and you're having good fun with your life. But I get the idea if you weren't disrupting and creating things over the next six months, years, two years – you could become bored, and I get the idea that that would be hell to you. So what are you challenging yourself with that keeps you lively, keeps you happy, and wants you to be in the environment you've created? Yeah. I mean, what I would say for people out there is to reflect on thinking about, like, do you want to live a what-if life? I love this phrase, what-if life. What if I could have done? What if? And you only regret the things you didn't do. You almost zero times ever regret the things you did do. So for someone out there that's listening, like, what's that thing I've wanted to do? Like, maybe I've always been curious about being social media. Maybe it's being e-commerce. Maybe it's being software. Maybe it's just making something creative with wood. Doesn't It doesn't have to be some crazy thing. Most people can get really rich in boring ways and not even sexy ways. There's also tech, which is where I'm from, but a lot of ways. Like, I have a strawberry salesperson. So... For myself, in terms of boring and challenging myself, I, I think what I've realized a lot of us do is all or nothing. It's like, oh, I got to go extreme and have some new crazy challenges. And it can also be smaller things. Like right now, I would say where I'm pushing myself in a good way is just being really present with my partner, my girlfriend, and really just like working on how am I not working all day? Because I, I, I truly... I, I, I didn't, I didn't used to like work this much. I'm really excited about it. It's just so cool. Like I get to talk with you. I'm talking about the book. I got to go interview a billionaire over here. Then I'm going to go work on marketing and uh, budgeting for AppSumo.com. And it's so cool. And so that can, that can consume a lot of my day. And I want to be more present for my partner. So removing a lot of my meetings before noon, if not all of them, finishing work by six. And that, that's really what I'm leaning more into. And in that saying my priority is my, my, my girlfriend and our family. And then my behavior is lining it up towards that for probably at least the next 18 years. That, 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 that's, that's my goal, <laughs> to, to be present so she feels uh, taken care of. You've mentioned a few times the YouTube channel. What is that? How can we find it? Yeah. Well, I think the other, uh, the other comment I, I, would, I would make on uh, boring and success and all these different things is I do think I, I was pretty miserable <laughs> for a long time, which I know is not sexy. Like it doesn't sell a Ferrari hearing that like, you know, I was living on floors and fired all the f time and how angry I was. Right. And I, I, I think for everyone out there who's like, oh, my boss sucks. I'm not getting my, you know, I'm not getting paid enough. My startup hasn't worked. My girlfriend's annoying. You know, number one is just starting to look internal inside and stop thinking about the outside. So for me, it's taken a lot of time, a lot of therapy, a lot of coaches. Uh, there's no one magic cold plunge that solves it. No Tony Robbins conference is going to magically save you. It's just thinking internally, okay, I'm not really frustrated with, I'm frustrated with work. All right, great. What can I do myself to feel good about myself with work? Don't like my, my significant other. I'm going to dump their ass, which took me three years to break up with someone to be able to be ready to then move on to the next branch. I had to let go of the old one. And these things take time where now at 41, oh man, I'm just so much more, I have more than enough and now it's time to give and just be, be content, which I'm more, I'm finally content and not needing more around these things. And that's available again for everyone. It did take me, I don't say 18 years, give or take to finally be able to get there. 
that. And I feel a lot better about it. Now, in terms of the, the YouTube channel, yeah, I, it's even interesting. I started doing YouTube six years ago. I posted my first video in 2006, which is crazy. But I, I started really kind of six years ago, and I didn't really want to do it. Uh, my buddy was like, let's just film you again, get on camera. And it was kind of forced to. And I, I didn't really commit to it. And the videos I don't think are that good. But in three, uh, three years later, COVID happened, and I just felt inspired. And, I, and that's why I love in Million Dollar Weekend, we talk about now, not how. Where if you're just vibing with something and you're thinking, you know, I like the three second rule, like don't give yourself, don't negotiate with terrorists, which is yourself. Don't be like, I, I, I don't know. I've always, just do it right now and see what happens. Like you want to sell something to your customers, post it on social media, send an email, send a text, send a Gmail email, and you could find out instantly if people want something. And so three years ago, I just got inspired because I felt really good during COVID. COVID is like my favorite holiday mm. where, you know, we actually call our parents. We talk to friends often. We don't focus on technology, we focus on connection. And I thought it brought out really the, as much as there was tragedy, it brought out a lot of beauty that uh, I'd like to say I'd keep some of it, but definitely it inspired me a lot. And so in that moment, I just started sharing how I'm approaching myself, my own personal finances and AppSumo's uh, business. And it was enjoyable because I wanted to do it. And that's how work should be. It doesn't become a job then if you actually want to do it. And it was knowing that I'm making content that I enjoy making as well as it's for an audience we call the underdogs. People who felt like myself, like I grew up around all these elite Harvard <laughs> thinking that they're better than us and realizing that they're not realizing we can do it too. And then I felt like, oh shit, through YouTube and these channels, I can share how I've learned from that these <laughs> as well as figured it out myself. And all of us are more capable than we realize. And so I was putting out this content uh, over a very long period of time in three years. Like I put out mostly 100, 150 videos and none of them were really super popular, but I enjoyed it. And then around 100, 148, uh, it wasn't really growing the way we wanted to. Like it was good, but it was, I was trying to copy everyone else. And I was like, why don't I do something no one else will do? And it was like, all right, let me try something crazy. I'm going to go knock on people's doors that have sick houses, really nice houses, and just ask what they do for a living. And no one was doing it. And I was like, all right, I'll try it. And I was really scared and I was very uncomfortable. I got a lot of rejections, but I also got some yeses. And that's what happens in rejection. You get a few yeses. And that's true for all things. And then that video went out, it got a million views. And now all of our videos are kind of like that. I, I go to people on the streets. I go to uh, first class passengers, private airports, yachts, uh, different cities. So that's been one of our, our content. And then our second content bucket is all, again, for underdogs, people to inspire in the business journey, uh, is asking billionaires and really rich people in interesting careers, you know, their regrets and how they got there. And the, that, that, those are the two major content buckets around uh, our YouTube channel. It's been fun, man. Like we just hit a million subscribers and this sounds kind of bad, but I don't really care about that. I know we're supposed to care and like, oh shit. I think I just got over myself and over the external validation and more, is this video something I'm proud of? And then making, you know, I do, I would like to see it do well. I like promoting things, but just make sure I'm proud of what I'm doing, which is in my control. And then just focusing on that more, way more so than like, okay, it's a million or half a million or a hundred thousand. So what's the, uh, what's the um, address for those? Yeah, you can go to YouTube.com. Just search Noah Kagan on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, or YouTube.com slash OKDork, I believe. But just search Noah Kagan on YouTube. Watch the Private Jet video. That's a fan favorite. My favorite, which no one watched, uh, was talking to a millionaire fisherman. <laughs> I got to go on a fishing boat trip with him and caught a lot of fish. No one watched it, but I was happy to share his story. <laughs> I was really happy about it. My, my producer, Jeremy, was like, it's not going to work. No one's going to watch it. And I was like, that's okay. Like, I'm going to watch it. Do it for you. Do it for you. Do, you made one comment, which I want to just um, pick on before we get back to, to, to the book. Uh, you mentioned about the coaches. A lot of people have the misconception that hugely successful people, you know, oh, they don't need coaching anymore. How do you get coaches or mentors when you're at the top of your game? When did you first realize that you could get further with help? I saw Mark Zuckerberg do it. When he was 24, he seemed like he's done pretty well. And he's also a genius. So the fact that he was recognizing that he might need some assistance and that literally every athlete on the planet has a coach. So the idea that you could do it without a coach is, is like, mm, okay, you're going to be the one in a trillion? Probably not. Uh, so seeing Mark do it. And then when I got fired by Facebook, I hired a, a life coach from Mark Pincus. He founded Zynga. And he was like, talk to this life coach, Erica. And it was just nice to have someone coach me someone who's figured out the 10,000 hours 
and then can change the tra- trajectory of your life for like $100 or $200. It's so cheap. It's insane. And so I look at every aspect of my life I want to improve on and then see who's the best at it and then figure out how do I pay them money and get a referral to them, either get a referral or just straight up, hey, I'm going to pay you money uh, as a way of having them help me. And so very specifically, uh, I use Dan from Reboot.io. He's my business coach. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, we had a meeting with him and he doesn't even talk really business strategy but I was sharing how I felt not connected to the future of AppSumo and specifically what we're doing in Q1. And he's like, well, what would you want it to look like? Well, I want a one pager that's very f- crystal clear that what's our goal for the year? What's our top three projects for Q1? And then every single leadership team scorecard. So finance team, people team, engineering team, sales team. I want their very clear Q1s. And I want us to all be on the same page. He's like, that sounds pretty clear. So I had a meeting yesterday afterwards and got every leader on the same page. And now we have a one pager which we had one, but I don't think it was very, no, we didn't fight over it. And it wasn't as clear for me, which means if I'm the leader, if it's not clear for me, it's not clear for everyone else. And that was through a 15 minute conversation with my business coach. Same thing goes with marketing. Uh, I have a guy, Moody Glasgow, former CMO of Zapier and Glassdoor. Uh, he basically tells me all the things I don't really want to do. And that's why he's a great coach because it's all the shit that I wasn't really thinking of, nor am I interested in. And so there's strategies around all this coaching stuff, but I, I think in general, how can you pay very little amounts of money relative for 10,000 hour people to help you, you know, frankly cheat and get ahead in, in almost every area of aspect of your life? I think people like my brother, God, I'm shitting on my brother a lot. Let me pick someone else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like even parenting, right? If you want to be a parent, people are like, well, I'm just going to wing it. I'm like, well, that's f- stupid. Like, do you, did you just wing everything else? And you're like, no, you went and study. Right. Like the reason I'm good with personal finance is I, my, fortunately, my stepfather is very good teaching me and I read a shit ton of books and then I had a lot of experience. And now I have wealth managers who coach me on all the stupid shit I'm doing or things I need to be doing. And so the same applies in parenting. The same applies in sports. If you want to get better, like I, I go to a squash coach, I have a boxing coach. I hurt myself. So I haven't gone to him in a few, little bit, but that's what I normally do. And I think that is a very good cheat code. And specifically, look at the people who've lived the lives and done very specifically things you want to do. Like Moody worked at the, some of the biggest SaaS companies and tech companies online. All right, that's a pretty good guy to get marketing price from. You know, uh, we have the chief people officer of Duolingo. I mean, that's a pretty amazing company. It looks like a cool product. And Christine's awesome. And she helps us with all of our people issues. MailChimp, giant ass SaaS company. That's our CFO advisor. So looking at the different aspects of your life and specifically within business, you can also hire, this sounds kind of strange, but you can hire really cheap, hungry people who care about your business and then put advisors and coaches above them to make the, help them become elite for a very affordable price because you can't, frankly, afford that coach to work for you full time. That's beautiful. So again, you're, when you get people involved, you're looking at the enthusiasm and the culture and then you bring in the, uh, the teachers to bring them up with the education that they're lacking. But as long as they've got the basics of that culture to start with, they're the people you need in your sandpit, correct? Yeah, same with the YouTube channel. I mean, I'm looking for attitude and follow up. Most people have, you know, I call it the immigrant me- immigrant mentality. Every immigrant chooses how hard they can work and they choose their attitude about it. And that there's no there's no limit on it and there's no law about it and everyone can do it. If you don't like something, you can change your attitude right now. Even if you're frustrated, you can be a little more optimistic. There's a great book, Learn to Optimism. And we, even with our YouTube channel, we hired the Mr. Beast's, uh, you, Mr. Beast's advisor. He's the number one YouTuber. So we pay him, I don't even know, thousands of dollars. I don't think it's tens of thousands, but monthly, ten, thousands of dollars monthly. And yeah, we went from 100,000 to a million subs. So yeah, I'm pretty good. Jeremy's good. Dylan's good. All our team is good. But why not cheat? Oh, I <laughs> like that. In a good way. I do like that. All right. So the book, it's available on Amazon. Please quote, where can, where's best for them to go? Where do you want people going to grab this book? Hmm. Amazon, you know, milliondollarweekend.com will have all the links. I'd go to milliondollarweekend.com and grab from there. What I'd love is people sending me photos of them with a the book That's and then cool. I'll reply to you. So send me on Twitter at Noah Kagan or Instagram at Noah Kagan. Uh, I'm really excited for that. I want to see people reading it on the beach or reading it on the subway or reading it at work and they're like, I hate my job. Let me get the f- out of here soon. <laughs> uh, or reading it with their kids. I think there's a lot of opportunities for kids to get creative in what they can do. Lawn mowing businesses, food stands selling door to door and safe environments and and so forth. So I'd love to see people taking photos with the book. I think I'm really excited for that. And then they take photos and they take action. Uh, I think we're gonna make a a little dent out there for people who want to change their lives. 
appreciate it. Noah, thank you so much for being a bundle of energy on this podcast. Dude, Steve Sims, dude. I love you, man. You're great. <laughs> Buddy, we will share this out. We will pull the links in the show notes. And, and trust him. You know, when you get it, read it, take a picture, send it to him. There's nothing that's going to make him feel better, warm and that's fuzzy, true. than knowing that you actually took some, some use from his words and you changed your life with it. So do uh, you know, take him up on his offer. Noah, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Stu. Bye. Pew, pew. Well, there you go. There was another episode of The Art of Making Things Happen, the podcast with me, Steve Sims. Remember, life's too short to play it safe, so disrupt, connect, and grow. See you next time.